Chapter 7 to 13, Book 2, Volume 1 of Le Mort d'Artur. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Tierney. Le Mort d'Artur, Volume 1 by Sir Thomas Mallory. Book 2, Chapters 7 to 13. Chapter 7. Now go we hence, said Balin, and well be we met. The meanwhile, as they talked, there came a dwarf from the city of Camelot on horseback, as much as he might, and found the dead bodies, wherefore he made great dole, and pulled out his hair for sorrow, and said, Which of you knights have done this deed? Whereby askest thou it, said Bolan? For I would wit it, said the dwarf. It was I, said Balin, that slew this knight in my defence, for hither he came to chase me, and either I must slay him, or he me, and this damosel slew herself for his love, which repenteth me, and for her sake I shall owe all women the better love. Alas, said the dwarf, thou hast done great damage unto thyself, for this knight that is here dead was one of the most valiantest men that lived, and trust well, Balin, the kin of this knight will chase you through the world till they have slain you. As for that, said Balin, I fear not greatly, but I am right heavy that I have displeased my lord King Arthur for the death of this knight. So as they talked together, there came a king of Cornwall riding, the which hight King Mark. And when he saw these two bodies dead, and understood how they were dead by the two knights above said, then made the king great sorrow for the true love that was betwixt them, and said, I will not depart till I have on this earth made a tomb. And there he pight his pavilions, and sought through all the country to find a tomb, and in a church they found one was fair and rich. And then the king let put them both in the earth, and put the tomb upon them, and wrote the names of them both on the tomb. How here lieth Lancior, the king's son of Ireland, that at his own request was slain by the hands of Balin, and how his lady, Columbe, and Paramour, slew herself with her love sword for dole and sorrow. Chapter 8 The meanwhile, as this was a doing, in came Merlin to King Mark, and seeing all his doing, said, Here shall be in this same place the greatest battle betwixt two knights that was or ever shall be and the truest lovers, and yet none of them shall slay other. And there Merlin wrote their names upon the tomb, with letters of gold that should fight in that place, whose names were Lancelot de Lake and Tristram. Thou art a marvellous man, said King Mark unto Merlin, that speakest of such marvels. Thou art a boisterous man, and an unlikely to tell of such deeds. What is thy name? said King Mark. At this time, said Merlin, I will not tell. But at that time, when Sir Tristram is taken with his sovereign lady, then ye shall hear and know my name, and at that time ye shall hear tidings that shall not please you. Then said Merlin to Balin, Thou hast done thyself great hurt, because that thou savest not this lady that slew herself, that might have saved her, and thou wouldest. By the faith of my body, said Balin, I might not save her, for she slew herself suddenly. Me repenteth, said Merlin, because of the death of that lady thou shalt strike a stroke most dolorous that ever man struck except the stroke of our Lord, for thou shalt hurt the truest knight, and the man of most worship that now liveth. And through that stroke three kingdoms shall be in great poverty, misery, and wretchedness twelve years, and the knight shall not be whole of that wound for many years. Then Merlin took his leave of Balin, and Balin said, If I wist it were sooth that ye say I should do such a perilous deed as that, I would slay myself to make thee a liar. Therewith Merlin vanished away suddenly. And then Balan and his brother took their leave of King Mark. First, said the king, tell me your name. Sir, said Balan, ye may see he beareth two swords, thereby ye may call him the knight with the two swords. And so departed King Mark unto Camelot to King Arthur, and Balan took the way toward King Rience, and as they rode together they met with Merlin disguised, and they knew him not. Whither ride you? said Merlin. We have little to do, said the two knights, to tell thee. But what is thy name? said Balin. At this time, said Merlin, I will not tell it thee. It is evil seen, said the knights, that thou art a true man, that thou wilt not tell thy name. As for that, said Merlin, be it as it may, I can tell you wherefore ye ride this way, for to meet King Rience, but it will not avail you without ye have my counsel. Ah, said Balin, ye are Merlin, we will be ruled by your counsel. Come on, said Merlin, ye shall have great worship. And look that ye do knightly, for ye shall have great need. As for that, said Balin, dread you not, we will do what we may. Chapter 9 
Then Merlin lodged them in a wood among leaves beside the highway, and took off the bridles of their horses, and put them to grass, and laid them down to rest them till it was nigh midnight. Then Merlin bade them rise and make them ready, for the king was nigh them, that was stolen away from his host with a threescore horses of his best knights, and twenty of them rode to four to warn the Lady de Vance that the king was coming, for that night King Rience should have lain with her. Which is the king? said Balin. Abide, said Merlin, here in a straight way ye shall meet with him. And therewith he showed Balin and his brother where he rode. Anon Balin and his brother met with the king, and smote him down, and wounded him fiercely, and laid him to the ground. And there they slew on the right hand and the left hand, and slew more than forty of his men, and the remnant fled. Then went they again to King Rience, and would have slain him had he not yielded him unto their grace. Then said he thus, Knights full of prowess, slay me not, for by my life ye may win, and by my death ye shall win nothing. Then said these two knights, Ye say sooth and truth, and so laid him on a horse litter. With that Merlin was vanished, and came to King Arthur aforehand, and told him how his most enemy was taken and discomfited. By whom? said King Arthur. By two knights, said Merlin, that would please your lordship, and tomorrow ye shall know what knights they are. Anon after came the knight with the two swords, and Balon his brother, and brought with them King Rience of North Wales, and there delivered him to the porters, and charged them with him. And so they two returned again in the dawning of the day. King Arthur came then to King Rience, and said, Sir King, ye are welcome, by what adventure come ye hither? Sir, said King Rience, I came hither by an hard adventure. Who won you? said King Arthur. Sir, said the king, the knight with the two swords, and his brother, which are two marvellous knights of prowess. I know them not, said Arthur, but much am I beholden to them. Ah, said Merlin, I shall tell you. It is Balin that achieved the sword, and his brother Balan a good knight. There liveth not a better of prowess and of worthiness, and it shall be the greatest dole of him that ever I knew of knight, for he shall not long endure. Alas, said King Arthur, that is great pity, for I am much beholden unto him and I have ill-deserved it unto him for his kindness. Nay, said Merlin, he shall do much more for you, and that shall ye know in haste. But, sir, are ye purveyed, said Merlin, for to morn the host of Nero, King Rience's brother, will set on you, or noon, with a great host, and therefore make you ready, for I will depart from you. Chapter 10 Then King Arthur made ready his host in ten battles, and Nero was ready in the field afore the castle Terrabil with a great host, and he had ten battles, with many more people than Arthur had. Then Nero had the vanguard with the most part of his people, and Merlin came to King Lot of the Isle of Orkney, and held him with a tale of prophecy, till Nero and his people were destroyed. And there Sir Kay the Seneschal did passingly well, that the days of his life the worship went never from him, and Sir Hervis de Revel did marvellous deeds with King Arthur and King Arthur slew that day twenty knights, and maimed forty. At that time came in the knight with the two swords, and his brother Balan. But they too did so marvelously that the king and all the knights marveled of them, and all they that beheld them said they were sent from heaven as angels, or devils from hell. And King Arthur said himself, they were the best knights that ever he saw, for they gave such strokes that all men had wonder of them. In the meanwhile came one to King Lot, and told him while he tarried there, Nero was destroyed and slain with all his people. Alas, said King Lot, I am ashamed, for by my default there is many a worshipful man slain, for in we had been together, there had been none host under the heaven that had been able for to have matched with us. This fator with his prophecy hath mocked me. All that did Merlin, for he knew well that an King Lot had been with his body there at the first battle, King Arthur had been slain, and all his people destroyed, and well Merlin knew that one of the kings should be dead that day, and loath was Merlin that any of them should both be slain. But of the twain, he had liefer King Lot had been slain than King Arthur. Now what is best to do, said King Lot of Orkney? Whether is me better to treat with King Arthur or to fight, for the greater part of our people are slain and destroyed? Sir, said a knight, set on Arthur, for they are weary and forfoughten, and we be fresh. As for me, said King Lot, I would every knight would do his part as I would do mine. And then they advanced banners, and smote together, and all to shiver their spears. And Arthur's knights, with the help of the knight with the two swords, and his brother Balan, put King Lot and his host to the worse. But always King Lot held him in the foremost front, and did marvellous deeds of arms. For all his host was borne up by his hands, for he abode all knights. 
Alas, he might not endure, the which was great pity, that so worthy a knight as he was one should be overmatched, that of late time afore had been a knight of King Arthur's, and wedded the sister of King Arthur. And for King Arthur lay by King Lot's wife, the which was Arthur's sister, and gat on her Mordred, therefore King Lot held against Arthur. So there was a knight that was called the Knight with the Strange Beast, and at that time his right name was called Pellinore, the which was a good man of prowess. And he smote a mighty stroke at King Lot as he fought with all his enemies, and he failed of his stroke, and smote the horse's neck, that he fell to the ground with King Lot. And therewith anon Pellinore smote him a great stroke through the helm and head unto the brows. And then all the host of Orkney fled for the death of King Lot, and there were slain many mother's sons. But King Pellinore bare the white of the death of King Lot. Wherefore Sir Gawain revenged the death of his father the tenth year after he was made knight, and slew King Pellinore with his own hands. Also there were slain at that battle twelve kings on the side of King Lot with Nero, and all were buried in the church of St. Stephen's in Camelot, and the remnant of knights and of others were buried in a great rock. Chapter 11 So at the interment came King Lot's wife Margossa, with her four sons, Gawain, Agravain, Gaheris, and Gareth. Also there came thither King Uriens, Sir Owain's father, and Morgan le Fay his wife, that was King Arthur's sister. All these came to the interment. But of all these twelve kings, King Arthur let make the tomb of King Lot passing richly, and made his tomb by his own. And then Arthur let make twelve images of Latin and copper, and overgilt it with gold in the sign of twelve kings, and each one of them held a taper of wax that burnt day and night, and King Arthur was made in sign of a figure standing above them, with a sword drawn in his hand, and all the twelve figures had countenance like unto men that were overcome. All this made Merlin by his subtle craft, and there he told the king, When I am dead, these tapers shall burn no longer, and soon after the adventures of the Sangreal shall come among you and be achieved. Also he told Arthur how Balin, the worshipful knight, shall give the dolorous stroke, whereof shall fall great vengeance. Oh, where is Balin and Balan and Pellinore, said King Arthur? As for Pellinore, said Merlin, he will meet with you soon, and as for Balin, he will not be long from you, but the other brother will depart, you shall see him no more. By my faith, said Arthur, they are two marvellous knights, and namely Balin passeth of prowess of any knight that ever I found, for much beholden am I unto him. Would God he would abide with me. Sir, said Merlin, look ye keep well the scabbard of Excalibur, for ye shall lose no blood while ye have the scabbard upon you, though ye have as many wounds upon you as ye may have. So after, for great trust, Arthur betook the scabbard to Morgan le Fay, his sister, and she loved another knight better than her husband, King Uriens, or King Arthur, and she would have had Arthur her brother slain, and therefore she let make another scabbard like it by enchantment, and gave the scabbard Excalibur to her love, and the knight's name was called Acolon, that after had near slain King Arthur. After this, Merlin told unto King Arthur of the prophecy that there should be a great battle beside Salisbury, and Mordred his own son should be against him. Also he told him that Bagdemegus was his cousin, and Germain unto King Uriens. Chapter 12 Within a day or two King Arthur was somewhat sick, and he let pitch his pavilion in a meadow, and there he laid him down on a pallet to sleep, but he might have no rest. Right so he heard a great noise of a horse, and therewith the king looked out at the porch of the great pavilion, and saw a knight coming even by him, making great dole. Abide, fair sir, said Arthur, and tell me wherefore thou makest this sorrow. Ye may little amend me, said the knight, and so passed forth to the castle of Meliot. On on after there came Balin, and when he saw King Arthur he alighted off his horse, and came to the king on foot, and saluted him. By my head, said Arthur, ye be welcome. Sir, right now came riding this way a knight making great mourn, for what cause I cannot tell. Wherefore I would desire of you, of your courtesy, and of your gentleness, to fetch again that knight, either by force or else by his good will. I will do more for your lordship than that, said Balin. And so he rode more than a pace, and found the knight with a damosel in a forest, and said, Sir knight, ye must come with me unto King Arthur, for to tell him of your sorrow. That will I not, said the knight, for it will scathe me greatly, and do you none avail. Sir, said Balin, I pray you make you ready, for ye must go with me, or else I must fight with you and bring you by force, and that were me loath to do. 
Will ye be my warrant, said the knight, and I go with you? Yea, said Balin, or else I will die therefore. And so he made him ready to go with Balin, and left the damosel still. And as they were even afore King Arthur's pavilion, there came one invisible, and smote this knight that went with Balin throughout the body with a spear. Alas, said the knight, I am slain under your conduct, with a knight called Garlon. Therefore take my horse that is better than yours, and ride to the damosel, and follow the quest that I was in as she will lead you, and revenge my death when ye may. That shall I do, said Balin, and that I make vow unto knighthood. And so he departed from this knight with great sorrow. So King Arthur let bury this knight richly, and made a mention on his tomb, how there was slain Herlus le Berbius, and by whom the treachery was done, the knight Garlon. But ever the damosel bare the truncheon of the spear with her, that Sir Herlus was slain withal. Chapter 13 So Balin and the damosel rode into a forest, and there met with a knight that had been a-hunting. And that knight asked Balin for what cause he made so great sorrow. Me list not to tell you, said Balin. Now, said the knight, and I were armed as ye be, I would fight with you. That should little need, said Balin, I am not afeard to tell you, and told him all the cause how it was. Ah, said the knight, is this all? Here I ensure you, by the faith of my body, never to depart from you while my life lasteth. And so they went to the hostelry and armed them, and so rode forth with Balin. And as they came by an hermitage, even by a churchyard, there came the knight Garlon, invisible, and smote this knight, Perrin de Montbelliard, through the body with a spear. Alas, said the knight, I am slain by this traitor knight that rideth invisible. Alas, said Balin, it is not the first despite he hath done me. And there the hermit and Balin buried the knight under a rich stone and a tomb royal. And on the morn they found letters of gold written, How Sir Gawain shall revenge his father's death, King Lot, on the King Pellinor. And on after this, Balin and the damosel rode till they came to a castle, and there Balin alighted, and he and the damosel went to go into the castle, and anon, as Balin came within the castle's gate, the portcullis fell down at his back, and there fell many men about the damosel, and would have slain her. When Balin saw that, he was sore aggrieved, for he might not help the damosel. Then he went up into the tower, and leapt over walls into the ditch, and heard him not, and anon he pulled out his sword, and would have foughten with them. And they all said nay, they would not fight with him, for they did nothing but the old custom of the castle, and told him how their lady was sick, and had lain many years, and how she might not be whole, but if she had a dish of silver full of blood of a clean maid and a king's daughter. And therefore the custom of this castle is, there shall no damoiselle pass this way, but she shall bleed of her blood in a silver dish full. Well, said Balin, she shall bleed as much as she may bleed, but I will not lose the life of her whiles my life lasteth. And so Balin made her to bleed by her good will, but her blood helped not the lady. And so he and she rested there all night, and had their right good cheer, and on the morn they passed on their ways. And as it telleth after in the Sangreal, that Sir Percival's sister helped that lady with her blood, whereof she was dead. End of Book 2, Chapter 7-13